Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I am uh, Amir Akbarnejad and uh, I am so excited to share uh, this work with you today. As, uh, as you know, uh, machine learning has got many applications in, uh, I don't know, predicting a stock market or optimizing uh, energy cons uh, consumption. And in such applications, uh, explainability is not so important. But how about applications like uh, medical diagnosis, autonomous driving, or fraud detection? In these applications, uh, the capability of machine learning can't be unleashed without uh, explainability. Uh, first of all, uh, in this talk, we are interested in explaining uh, ANNs or artificial neural networks. And the, the existing trends uh, for explaining ANNs uh, bring in addi some additional assumptions. For instance, locally linear explainers like LIME or I don't know, perturbation based method, methods or gradient based methods, uh, methods like SHAP, I don't know, grad GradCam, all of them come with. Uh, all of them bring in some additional assumptions. But uh, in today's talk, I'm going to share with you an approach which doesn't imply any, uh, which, uh, which doesn't impose any simplifying assumptions. And uh, before, uh, before we move on, uh, I want to bring in uh, more of a high, uh, more of a high, uh, high level a discussion about how machine learning, about how a machine learning model solves its tasks. Uh, I'm going to talk about transductive learning versus inductive learning. Let's say our goal is to conclude that uh, Peter is mortal. In the transductive approach, uh, we we make some uh, we observe that Jake was perished, therefore Jake is mortal. Paul was perished, therefore Paul was mortal and also Tom was perished. And directly from this, we can uh, conclude that Peter is fairly similar to Jake, Paul, and Tom. Therefore, Peter is mortal. And this is the transductive reasoning. On the, uh, on the other hand, in inductive reasoning, uh, we have a general rule, which is uh, humans are mortal. And then we apply this uh, rule uh, no, sorry, before doing that, we observe that uh, Peter is a human. Therefore, we apply this rule uh, to Peter, and therefore we conclude that Peter is mortal. Just a brief interruption. Sure, sure, sure. That, sure. Not, that is not inductive reasoning. You need to read a paper that distinguishes abductive, inductive, and abductive reasoning. What you just showed us was purely deductive reasoning purely deductive, not inductive at all. Just this is the, don't take it personally, but this is a caution for you. If you put this in front of a mathematician or a logician or anybody who has studied AI the way I have, um, they wouldn't have patience with you. Yes, yes, sure, sure. I completely understand that deduct, it is deductive, yeah. But you know, it, this is the buzzword. Uh, I, I will show you some websites that, uh, I don't know, in machine learning, some people call this, inductive but of so course it is got, your field so just so you know they've got this is completely wrong so don't pay attention to those people don't adopt their errors okay, you okay. can tell i feel quite strongly about this because it's just wrong nobody okay. on the planet except badly educated machine learning people would use and distinguish this as inductive reasoning nowhere anywhere okay okay sure and sure then then i would call this deductive okay, okay. For you, it's a caution. And, and so let me add something. Uh, independent of your talk, you and I should meet sometime to go over things that I can provide help because I promised Nalaj and I would do that for all of his students. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Then I will uh, I will call this way of reasoning deductive throughout my presentation. Yeah. You, you don't sure, have sure. to change. Uh, you have to change because you want to be accurate. That's all. That's sure, complete, sure. a completely specious label. And if any, if any papers, let me know the list of papers of people who have labeled this in that way, and I will do my best to correct them. I don't care who they are. Okay, okay. Sure, sure. Thank sure. you. And I'll no. be quiet now for at least no. a while. Okay, okay. Uh, but uh, as a recap, in transductive reasoning, uh, we directly go from observations to, uh, to the conclusion without uh, concluding any 
any rule uh, from the data. But in, uh, tr uh, in deductive reasoning, uh, we observe the data and from the data, a rule will be uh, inferred and then the rule is applied to uh, Peter in this case. If, uh, if we look at these two uh, ways of reasoning side by side, uh, you may notice that this way of reasoning is, is somehow an overkill for the problem. Because if you remember, we wanted to reach a conclusion uh, for Peter. We didn't want a general rule. Uh, and doing this uh, is basically an overkill because inferring a general rule from data might be I don't know, energy comes uh, consuming and time comes uh, consuming. But isn't it oh. necessary? Yes, hmm. sorry, I'm not much more into the logic. It is, I understand it is the mathematical stuff which is in your interest here. Uh, yeah, sorry, I should just be quiet because there's no so, so many misleading things. Transductive, what the hell is that? Anyway, keep going. Okay, okay, sure. Humans are mortal is the rule which helps explain why you made the inference about Peter from uh, knowledge about Jake, Paul, and Tom. Every logician I know would tell you that. Okay, okay. Yeah. So what you, what, it seems to me you're motivating the creation of explanations by throwing them away at the outset and saying, oh yeah, generating a covering rule is too expensive. Oh no no! I am not. Uh, I am. I am uh, completely on your side that we do. We solve. Uh, we solve our problems in this way. But I think uh, the next observations that I'm going to show you will be very interesting. Yeah. Will be. Okay. Well, let's. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I have uh, created an, a slideo, and I am going to just uh, send a question in. A slide in a minute, in a second. Okay, uh, please, uh, you can, it is a, a slide. I know many of you are, are, uh, are already familiar with that. You can go to slido.com and seminar March 18 to answer this poll, or you can also scan this, uh, this barcode here. Let's say we have a K nearest neighbor classifier. The question is how a KNN classifier cl uh, solves its tasks. Is it transductive reasoning or deductive reasoning? Maybe I should have. Uh, the first one is uh, by looking at the observations or training set. The, the second one is by making a general rule and then applying that rule to test instances. Okay, I think, uh, I think it is very easy because KNN uses the transductive reasoning because it says that, maybe I should uh, go back to a slides to show you that. Uh, I think the KNN is uh, fairly simple because uh, the way it solves this task is like X test is similar to X1 and X2 and X3. It is very similar to Peter is similar to Jake, Tom and Paul. And then uh, let's... Uh, Similarity needs to be defined. It's a word that's used by many people um, without definition. What do you think similarity means? Okay, uh, I, I completely understand. Is it okay if we move that discussion to the end of the presentation? Because that's the whole okay. point. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the second question is that, let's say a CNN is trained uh, on a data set to classify images. How does it classify a test image? Is it transductive or deductive? Okay, you mean, I wish I could see how many people have voted. Okay, okay. Oh, deductive, yeah. I can't, I can't vote because I don't know what transductive means. Uh, you should continue, but just 
I, I don't know how you can ask people for input when you haven't provided a definition of transductive. In fact, I don't think there is a definition. You've taken two different words and jammed them together. And it may be that you read a literature where that makes sense, and maybe there's background for it making sense. Doesn't make sense to reasoning. Anyway. Sure, sure. But, uh, but transductive, if you're familiar with, I don't know, graph, uh, I don't know, for instance, GCNs in, I don't know, in social networks, the decision made for a user depends on the, I don't know, the close friends. And for instance, that's an example of transductive machine learning. But uh, I think 100% of people the think uh, CNNs basically make general rules and then they apply those rules to, to the test instance, right? Okay, I wish I could, uh, oh, I think four people have voted for that. But uh, let's, uh, let's continue. Uh, CNN, uh, of course, the, 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 the well-known thing, the well-known pattern is that the CNN classifier uses uh, deductive reasoning, meaning that given training data, it trains some rules or, I don't know, which are known as uh, high-level features. And then those rules which, uh, are applied to unseen test instances. And if you search this question in Quora, what is the difference between uh, deducting, deductive and transductive learning? The first uh, reply is that induction is a learning from training cases to general rules, and then they are applied to test cases. But transduction is, of course, another thing, like, uh, like I said, for instance, in social networks. And uh, you may... Uh, here you notice that they mentioned the, uh, the, the machine learning model can understand the hidden, hidden patterns, I don't know, the high level features, etc. But we will, get, we will get back to this question. Now, I've, uh, I've never seen an academic or a scholarly person use Quora to refer to anything. It's almost totally, totally opinion of uninformed people. I'm not sure why you chose Quora to illustrate this. Okay, yeah, sure. Anyway, you, I'm obviously sure, cranky sure. about the scholarship. I'll do my best to be quiet. No, no, I understand that, especially because you are very, I don't know, you are, your specialty is logic and this stuff, yeah. But I understand that, you know, if one reason that uh, I was familiar with that is that a long time ago, I was working on, I don't know, graph on social networks. And uh, they, they mentioned that they are in transductive setting. They don't have a model that generalizes. And for instance, they sometimes have such, a, such models, but they, the common approach is to, for instance, look at the users which are connected or are friends of users A, to make predictions for that user here. Maybe that's why I, I was familiar with this here. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Sure. Uh, just the point about this deductive inductive thing. Well, uh, my field is uh, generally linguistics, so I'm not very familiar with logic, but again, in linguistics and in syntax and in grammar, uh, inductive means that you have a set of examples and then you come up with a rule and then you can apply that rule to other things. But yeah, when you yeah. have a rule, you start with the rule that already exists, and then you apply that to the examples, that would be deductive. Well, at least that's what we have in grammar and syntax. And that's been the long history of linguistics for a hundred years. So thank you for adding that. It's not just it's not just the crazy computer scientist who studied logic, but this notion of, of induction versus deduction is endemic in all of mathematics, including formal computational linguistics for a long time. So thanks for adding that. I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it was uh, a little bit, uh, I, do. I think uh, the, the next discussion and how it connects to the previous discussion will be interesting. And now uh, we will get back to the, that discussion, the different ways of reasoning. Now I am going to explain how we explain uh, the artificial neural networks. We have, uh, of course, a suspicious uh, model, which is not self-explanatory, which are artificial neural networks, as you know. 
And on the right, we have a nice person with, who is self-explanatory. And in this case, they are uh, Gaussian processes. And the idea is that if the two models is, uh, decisions match, then uh, the explanations from the nice model will reveal how uh, the black box model uh, makes predictions. But the general idea is to, uh, to kind of make the decisions of these uh, both uh, this, uh, the model on the right to match the decisions from the model on the left. And coming next is an introduction to the NICE model or Gaussian processes. Uh, of course, many of you may already be familiar with them. A Gaussian distribution is a way of defining a probability over random vectors, but Gaussian processes are a way of defining probability distributions over random functions. Uh, for instance, when having a, a Gaussian distribution, each generated sample is a, a random vector. But for Gaussian processes, instead of having a random vectors, we will have a random generated functions, as, as you see here. For instance, I don't know, sample function one, sample function two. These are samples from our Gaussian process. And here is our prior. We see that some samples are generated from that. And let's say we have some observations, which are the, the, the solid dots here. And this is called the Gaussian process posterior. We see that they, when having some observations, the generated functions are required to pass uh, the observed uh, values. And it is common to show this uh, posterior uh, using such, a, such an image. Here we see that uh, the blue curve is basically the mean of the Gaussian process posterior. And uh, the gray zone shows the uncertainty, meaning that near observations, we have uh, zero uncertainty. But uh, for instance here, because uh, there are no nearby uh, instances, we see a high uncertainty. And another interesting point about Gaussian processes is that they make predictions based on nearest neighbors. For instance, here we see that uh, here, the posterior sees that there are two nearby samples, one here and one here. Therefore, it concludes that the mean has to be somewhere here. Of course, it is more flexible than that, but we are going to use this uh, nearest neighbor regression notion a lot in the, in the coming slides. But if you are not familiar with Gaussian processes, you can think of them as uh, nearest neighbor regression and you can follow the rest of the presentation. As, uh, as I said, Gaussian processes are highly explainable. They are basically black box, uh, sorry, white box models, because intuitively they make decisions based on nearest neighbors. And they can also express uncertainty, or they can say, I don't know. When uh, there are no close by, like, no close by observed instances, they can express high uncertainty. But, uh, but when there are some nearby uh, observed instances, they can express low uncertainty, meaning that they are, they are certain about the, their prediction. And the coming next is an introduction to the suspicious model or ANN, but of course many of you are already familiar with that. Uh, artificial neural networks are commonly used this state because of the tools and methods for training, I don't know, state-of-the-art accuracies, and because they are uh, theoretically proven global estimators. And we see that the usage, for instance, in a Springer data set has been ramping up recently. And then as you know, uh, the, uh, the ANNs have the black box issue, meaning that their decisions are not may not be interpretable to humans. There are some explain, uh, explanation methods, like I don't know, Lime, Shap, gradient-based explanation methods. But uh, none of these methods provide uh, reliable explanations because uh, they bring in additional assumptions. But the explanation method that I'm going to show you uh, doesn't impose any additional assumption. Basically, we want the white box model to exactly match the black box model. And as a, re as, a re as a recap, we have ANNs, which are black box. We have Gaussian processes, which are white box. 
And the idea is that if the two models' decisions match, then the nice model can explain how the black box model makes uh, decisions. Coming, uh, coming next is the, the analogy between ANNs and GPs and under what conditions uh, this analogy can happen. Uh, there is a line of research uh, about having some conditions on an artificial neural network. It becomes equivalent to a Gaussian process, or I should say to a Gaussian process uh, posterior mean. And the, the analogy was uh, first discovered by Neil et al. Uh, in 2010 or so. And the initial theoretical result was uh, for a very simple neural for, was for a very simple neural network. For instance, it was a feed forward network with only one hidden layer, and the weights were initialized randomly, meaning that the network was not allowed to be trained. By, uh, but there are some recent findings which kind of lift these uh, restrictive conditions. The network it can have more than one hidden uh, one hidden layers, or it can be a deep neural network, and the neural network can be trained. And uh, this, uh, these results uh, have been discovered very recently. For instance, I don't know, two thousand eighteen, etc. And our framework's uh, task is find a. Uh, is finding some GPs whose decisions almost match those of the ANNs. Uh, this is basically because if you remember, the goal is to make the decisions from the white box model to match the decisions from the black box models. And uh, if you look at the paper, uh, uh, you know the GPs, uh, training GPs has a lot of uh, computational difficulties, but if you look at the paper, it is safe to say that we could make the white box model to exactly match the black box model. For instance, these are the images that uh, I was getting during the uh, during debugging the project. And what I was doing was that uh, we can feed a mini batch of instances to GPs to get such a matrix on the left. And here we see that, for instance, we have uh, 10, 10 rows meaning that we have uh, 10 instances in our mini batch and we have one, two, three, four, five. And we have 10 GPs, meaning that the output of the ANN or the output of the model is 10 dimensional. And we see that for the same mini batch, we see that the decisions or the outputs of the white box model and the black box model almost matches. And you can refer to the paper to kind of uh, see how we compare the outputs of the this the black box and the white box model, but I can tell you that the correlations are I don't know 97, 98, etc. And as a recap, um, we had a as a recap, there is a suspicious model which are the ANNs, and we had a white box model which are Gaussian processes, and we could make these two models basically the same. And the next step is that the white box model is going to tell us how the black box model makes uh, predictions in the test phase. Before you go on, can you tell me why you sure. want the white and the black box to have, uh, have identical structure? Doesn't that defeat the whole idea of explainability? And, and, and the consequence is that you have to be able to consider what level the knowledge is at. So think about explaining to your grandmother how a television works. Do you have to explain quantum physics? Oh, I think, uh, I think you know, uh, like, uh, uh, as you said, it is very important for the explanation, for the explanations to be usable for humans. But uh, if once I show you the explanations, I think it is it makes sense to all humans. And uh, once uh, I got these explanations on a histopathology data set, and I think uh, we could kind of, uh, after a talk with my co-supervisor, Dr. Bigras, I think the explanations were making sense to an expert pathologist. Well, you yeah. just finished saying they make, they make sense to everyone. Then you said they make sense to an expert. Those are two different groups. The whole literature of explainable AI 
has as a foundation the fact that you need different explanations for different groups. But you said explicitly in a previous slide that you want the structure of the white box to be identical to the black box. Yeah, yeah, so I think both, I, those I, things, both those things can't happen simultaneously. It's a contradiction. Yes, yes, I, I know what the, what the, you know, the pre, because you are presuming that the ANN does a very, I don't know, complicated task. And that's why we need, I don't know, some complicated stuff to unbox that. But once I show you the result, we will see that ANNs make predictions in a simple way, actually. Yeah, I, I <laughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, please uh, remember that Gaussian processes or our white box model makes uh, makes predictions based on looking at some nearest neighbors, pretty much like K in and regression. And when the analogy happens, it, it means that the, the neural network's decisions are also based on nearest neighbors. And we can look at the nearest neighbors to explain the ANN's decisions. And uh, to the, if, and actually we did this for uh, some models and some data sets. For instance, we picked the AMNIS data set. As you know, the, the data set contains uh, images from digits. And we used a ResNet 18 model, which is a relatively a recent model. And the accuracy of the model reached 99.7%, which is pretty much perfect, near 100%. And here is an example explanation. Here we see a one digit, which is a, a test instance. And here are the closest or nearest uh, tra training images, which are found in the training uh, set. This, this picture shows us that this image has been classified as one because the model thinks this one digit is similar to these one digits in the training set. And let's uh, let's add another explanation for a second one digit. It, this image shows us that, that test instance two is classified as one because the model thinks this one digit is similar to this one digit that we are seeing here. Basically, uh, what this picture tells us is that this image, uh, this one digit has been classified as one because the model has found some one digits which are inclined by the same degree as this one digit. But this one digit is classified as one because the model has found some upright standing one digit in the, in the training set. Sorry, you just gave us an explanation. That, that, that imaging is not an explanation. It's a set of images. You explicitly verbalized your version of an explanation. It's not produced by this. It's your interpretation of it. Yes, yes, but, but you know, Gaussian processes make prediction based on nearest neighbors. And no, no, I understand, I understand that part of it. Um, are, are you telling all of this audience that um, you're using a Gaussian predictor as a proxy for explanation? Yes, yes, uh, you know. Then you I have to just... educate the whole world looking for explanations about what a Gaussian process is. That's maybe even feasible or possible. But be very careful, you don't, you don't convolve one method as an explanatory method with the explanations you produce so that is verbally the, if i may the, if no i may what you're saying amir is that the explanation is this is a one because all these 10 other ones are also ones yep exactly exactly you know because it has found the, the one digits with similar inclination in the data set and I think that you're making a very strong assumption, though. The assumption is that the GP has access to the training data that the neural network has used. Yeah. And oh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. You know, that's, uh, very, that's a very strong assumption because yeah. often you have a black box that is trained and then you deploy it. You have no access to the training data. You only have access to the black box. 
then the GP cannot be trained. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, you know, uh, like you said, because a uh, GP needs to have access to some data so that it can match its output to the ANN. But, uh, but, but the matching happens also for the testing set, you know, the matching uh, generalizes. For instance, here, here we see the analogy has happened for the test, for the test instances. So if I can add something, I mean, here. Sure, sure. That, um, so number one, your explainability is basically reduced to the interpretation, the way we interpret K and N. It's K nearest neighbor. So that's number one. Number two is that you're going to be training a GP along with your black box model A and N, right? These two things are going to be trained simultaneously. So if you make these assumptions um, upfront, then maybe the audience is, okay, they may not accept, or they may say that the assumptions are limiting, but they're very clear about your assumptions. So I, 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 what I agree with is, is I can agree, like I think Osmar is agreeing with, is that um, describing the predictions of the black box when you're not willing to explain how this high dimensional matrix has been weighted, if you're explaining it in terms of a Gaussian process, then what you're saying Gaussian processes provide explanations in terms of Gaussian process concepts. Okay with me. Oh, sorry. I think, uh, of course, so happy that uh, I could kind of bring in a controversial thing. But to me, you know, because this analogy is on the test set, to me, these models are the same. Um, that's, um, that's an assumption about what part of the distribution the test set represents. And I wouldn't want to make that because no credible machine learning person is going to say that the model is, is generalized to all possible inputs based on a sample. Oh, no, no, no. By the way, we, we computed the correlations on, I don't know, on thousands of testing samples. Yep. To, yeah, yeah, but I understand. I don't want to kind of push my thought, but uh, I, I, I am I'm personally convinced that these yep. two models that we are looking at are the same. I'm saying something positive in that sense is that is that the, the whole talk so far focuses on one key thing, and that is that Gaussian processes are a proxy for explanations to humans who understand Gaussian processes, because you're seeing the Gaussian process and how it is developed and modeled is uh, completely analogous to the ANN. Uh, even if that isn't the case, that's your claim, and I understand that as a proxy for explanation. So, so that's fine. That explanation is going to be useless to every human in the world who doesn't understand Gaussian processes. So, uh, Amir, I, I'm going to ask you a question here, uh, sure, which sure. is that um, would you consider KNN as an explain explainable model or not? Your entire yes, yes, yes. talk is based on that assumption, right? Yes, yes. I think, uh, you know, the issue is that uh, my co-supervisor has some background in computer engineering and computer science, but this kind of explanation was completely understandable to my co-supervisor, who is a pathologist. No, okay, I'm sorry, I'm still looking for the answer. So between a KNN and an ANN, which one would you consider more explainable as an explainable model? Of course, of course, KNN, yeah. Right, so I think that's your starting point. Now, some people will definitely not accept KNN as a completely explainable model because there are various issues around it, right? But you could just uh, say that this is my assumption that I am modeling KNN as my explainable model. Right? And then your entire machinery is built around that assumption. Yes, in addition to that, I think uh, the KNN is a very good explanation for some applications, depending upon who's the explainee. But in some other applications, it's not enough because you tell me this is a one because the others are one. But if I'm not convinced, convinced that the others are ones, then I'm not convinced of the explanation. But in, in medical applications, if, if the doctor wants to see 
other cases similar to that one, why this one has cancer, because the others also, you told me they have cancer and they're similar, then maybe it's an explanation in that application. But we cannot- Exactly, Yep, yep. Thank you, thank for the clarity, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the overall summary of comments is just you need to be much more cautious about what you're producing and what counts as an explanation because um, you haven't said anything about evaluating explanations except to say that your co-supervisor has input because he has some background as a computer engineer. From my point of view, that's actually dangerous. Um, you haven't said anything about evaluating explanations. Okay, okay, anyway, sure, 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 sure. I will anyway. continue there. Okay, I am going to show you more explanations in this way. And first of all, here we see the explanations for three test instances. And here we see that this two is classified as two because some similar two digits with similar style have been found. And here we see that for the second test instance, we see that this two, they found similar two digits are more or less with the same style. And for the third one as well, we see that this is classified as two because it has found these similar digits. And here we see explanations for uh, six digits. Just uh, so you be careful with your word explanation. All of the work on explanation for 50 years has been based on trying to improve the technical precision of the use of that word and you just put up this slide and said look at these explanations these aren't explanations okay, okay. you are explaining them to us that means as nelanjan said you have some assumption buried deep in what you're doing and i i'm suggesting you should be much more cautious because um, the word explanation and explainable ai is being increasingly used with precision to try to define it formally. So, I, I okay, call, sure, sure. I would call them justification by analogy. So you, okay. the, uh, the analogy with other cases that have been labeled the same right. way in the training data. Okay, yeah. okay, sure. Then if this, if we see that, for instance, this four digit is classified as four, you may notice that it has a short, short stand. And here we see that uh, maybe these training instances has have saved this model to be classified as four. For instance, here we see that, for instance, for this four digit, we see that something extra exists at the bottom of the stack. And we see that, for instance, this tend to happen in the nearest neighbors. In, in these four justifications, we see that for the first digit and the fourth digit, the, the testing instance and the nearest neighbors are more or less the same. For the third, for the second digit, we see that the test instance is an eight with a missing upper circuit. We see that the first two training instances are also, or maybe I should say th three, are also eights with missing upper left circles. And also for instance here. And for the third one, we see that this weird looking eight is similar to this eight that we are seeing here. For, for these justifications, uh, for the first one, we see that the test instance has, a, has, an, has an incomplete upper right circuit. We see that the found uh, training instances have also upper rights, missing upper right. Here, for instance, we see that all of the nines are inclined, for instance, in this way. And here we see that all of the nines are escalant, for instance, in this way here. I think I, I cannot go through all of the justifications. I think I, think I am going to uh, postpone uh, these questions a bit. If we also, uh, I am going to show you some justifications for the CIFAR 10 dataset. As you know, the dataset contains 60,000 images and labels are airplane, automobile, I don't know, bird, etc. And uh, on CIFAR 10, uh, ResNet 18 reaches about 95%, I think 95.6% accuracy. And here we see some justifications for airplane. And for, uh, to us, an, uh, an airplane which is taking off is more or less the same as a, uh, an airplane which is flying. 
but we see that for a vendor test instance is, I don't know, taking off. They found similar training ins instances tend to be taking off, but for this flying uh, aircraft, we see that they, they found similar training instances also tend to be flying. And here uh, for the first four examples, uh, we see that the test instances are captured from uh, a cat's face. And we see that they found uh, similar training instances are also tend to be captured from a cat's face. But uh, for the cats which are seen from far away, the training instances are also captured from far away. You know, because these models uh, do not have any knowledge about 3D geometry, uh, once they, they are given a test instance, they have to find similar training instances which are captured from the same angle or same distance. And in the paper, you can check that this pattern kind of repeats very constant, consistently. Here we see that this happens for birds as well. You know, here we see birds' faces, and we see that they found similar training instances are also from birds' faces. But these birds are seen from far away, and the similar, they found similar training instances uh, are also alike. Here we see that for this uh, first two testing instances, it, these are uh, some images from horses' faces. And here we see that the nearest neighbors also tend to be from horses' faces. But for these three instances, we see that the, the found similar instances and the similar training instances are seen from far away. Here we see that uh, these are some horses with riders, and we see that the found similar training instances are also horses with riders. In this, uh, in this, in first and second and third example, we see some deers with horns, and we see that the found uh, similar training instances are also deers with horns. With, uh, for these three instances, we see birds with this kind of body shape, and we see that the found similar uh, the the found similar training instances are also birds with similar body shape. And in some cases, in these cases, we see that the model has found at least one, one training instance, which has been very similar to the test instance. For instance, for this dog, we see that this training image is, is very similar to this one. For this thing, this frog, we see that this frog is almost captured from the same angle and also this frog to some degree. We see that this happens for this test instance and its first nearest neighbor as well, and also here. And here also we see that the model has found a training instance, which is very close to the test instance. And here, for instance, we see these patterns also happen. These are examples from the model's failure. Here, a, we see an airplane image, which is classified, which is misclassified as a cat. And we see that they, they found similar training instances or images captured from a cat's face. And if you look closely at this image, you may notice a cat's face in this image. The second image is a, is a deer, which is misclassified as a horse. You may notice that this image is very close to this horse image. Here we see a dog, a, a dog's image which is misclassified as a horse, uh, sorry, as a cat. We see the background is cyan and red. And if you look at all of these examples, these are cats with cyan and red background. And to me, I understand that it is justification, but it is not random that all of these instances are cats with, I don't know, cyan and red background here. We see that this, I think this is a dog which is classified as a horse. Again, we see that it justifies what may have gone wrong. These two cases are uh, frog faces. We see that in, those, in these cases, it understands that faces are close to faces, but it fails to understand that this frog face is similar to a frog face. It's, it thinks it is similar to, I don't know, a cat face, I don't know, bird face, etc. 
And in this case, uh, we see that this horse is classified as an airplane. And we see that all of the airplanes are inclined in this direction. And interestingly, it is also uh, the model thinks this is also similar to this frog. And it thinks that, I don't know, it is something that is taking off. Yeah. And here are some explanations for ships. Uh, in the data set, we don't have separate labels for uh, small uh, boats and I don't know, huge cargo ships, but we see that uh, the model uh, no, uh, has understood that, uh, for instance, these uh, small ships are close to or similar to uh, small ships, while these uh, huge cargo ships are similar to these uh, huge cargo ships. I think now I should move on to a slide or next slide or question. Okay. Uh, I am going to ask you the face same question. Yeah, I think I should make a copy of it. To delete that slide. Okay, okay it doesn't. Okay, I think it doesn't let me, but uh, but please uh, please answer this question again. Let's say, do you think the CNN classifier makes a general rule, or does it make decisions based on looking at nearest or similar instances to the test instance in the training set? I don't know whether you can still answer the same poll twice. Okay, I think. Okay, I think uh, then I would actually invite you to kind of uh, raise your hand and bring in your points. Do you think? Uh, do you still think these models, I don't know, work in a different way or were you convinced by our explanations? Uh, hello, Amir. Can oh, I ask hello. questions? Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. First of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah, I just have some comments about uh, explanation and description. For example, let us say you, you give us some bird examples and the ship's example, right? And you, you say that these are kind of, uh, how to say, uh, explanations. Yeah, if you go to this slide, for example, small ships versus cargo ships, uh, I guess this is description, I mean, rather than explanation. And because description and explanation is a little bit different concept, right? Explanations answer to the questions, questions of why. In my point of view, a good explanation would be something like this. This is a small ship because, we need to complete the sentence, right? Because, uh, yeah, I, I know that, for example, when we look at this image, we see that, okay, these are small ships, but probably providing because would also be good addition to bring kind of reliable explanations. Oh, no, no, sorry. I think, uh, you know, the point that I agree, the point that these, uh, for instance, for this case, the point that these training instances have come, have, contributed the most for this decision being made, that is that is for sure, that is not uh, unreliable. But uh, the, the point that I mentioned that, okay, these are all uh, small things, I, I agree that that part is description. But, but the effect of these things, because we know how Gaussian processes work and we know that we know that the two models have matched, then the nearest neighbors are not questionable. That is for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, probably, you know, uh, as Professor Anders said, I mean, explanations are not kind of universal. We need different explanations for different uh, target audience, right? So for each probably, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> for each person, we may have different kinds of explanations. So probably you may think about, for example, how you can uh, classify people with respect to their background. 
in uh, in the problem that you would like to solve from the explanatory perspective, right? For example, let us say you deliver explanation to AI person and you deliver explanation to a lay person who does not have a technical background. So probably, I mean, classifying explanations would, uh, would be kind of good idea here. And the one thing I, I would like to also uh, to share here is uh, maybe you can check this link. Okay. It gives some overview on uh, notions of explainability and how to evaluate explainable AI approach. Okay, okay, sure. Thank you very much, Shine. I will yeah. I will look into it later. I'm sure. Yeah. But uh, I think uh, sorry, I think Shine was also because I I presented uh, the same work, but uh, of course I presented the explanations for the medical data. I think Shahin and uh, Shahin was also present in the Ames conference, and the medical stuff were very uh, making sense to people from the medical side. But I understand that in the current literature, they kind of suggest to separate the audience. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean. How to say, my general point is that, I mean, explanations are not kind of, how to say, universal. There is no one explanation that, I mean, can be understood by all explanation receivers. So probably maybe you may need uh, to come up with an idea how to group explanations with respect to, yeah, yeah. I mean, audience background. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, I understand your, the literature that you're referring to. You know, because the point is that uh, they they weren't able to kind of provide reliable explanations, and you know, as long as uh, some description was making sense to humans, they were taking it as a good explanation. But, but you know, the the difference yes, you haven't. Yeah. Your computer scientist is you haven't defined what you mean by reliable and how you can measure it or what humans accept as an explanation. If you can't quantify or somehow qualitatively calibrate explanations you have no hope of providing them um, you said uh, you said that for example in this case you you your vocabulary um, uh, you've slipped into a vocabulary where you talk about about um, Gaussian distributions and k-means classification as uh, explanation for why uh, an ANN would make a prediction of a particular image being a small ship or a cargo ship or whatever it is. That that's okay, but what? How would you evaluate whether those are useful or good? Um, otherwise, um, as Shaheen says, is that an explanation isn't of any use whatsoever if you can't determine whether or not it's quote, a good explanation by some measure. I, I see, I think. Yeah, I All think of the things yeah. you've called explanations so far are your work on attempting to show that a Gaussian process and the, and the k-means analysis explains why a, a black box neural net has made this classification errors in uh, d distinguishing a deer from a horse, for example. That's what you're doing. You're explaining errors of the mechanism. You're not providing an explanation. Yeah, yeah, sure, but... Okay, but... That, that, no, that, that doesn't mean what you're doing is not potentially useful. Oh, no, no, we are going to use that to troubleshoot our models. I think that this, uh, this line of research became very hot as of, I don't know, 2019. And you may notice that, for instance, Google, Google Brain team has a very recent paper, which is called Tangent Net. And uh, I don't know, some people in Cambridge are very active in that, but somehow we made the last step to basically what they, were, they failed to do was to reach this kind of analogy that we are reaching. But we made the very last step, you know, it is a very reliable way of explanation if you ask my opinion, but. No, no it's, it's, not, it's not in anywhere close to the last step. I, I recommend you read anything by Rich Caruana recently about his so-called explainable boosting machines. That might help you. Okay, okay, sure, sure. Please send me those things. I would but, agree that instead of calling an explanation, you, you're opening a can of worms by saying that and claiming that. What you're trying to do is saying, the black box labeled this image, this test image as this class. Well, 
uh, here are other images that are from the same class. So basically, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm allowing the user to build some trust that, OK, I will agree with the black box because these other examples are similar enough and they are labeled the same way. But you're not giving an explanation why that one per se is yeah. uh, classified as a, a boat or an animal or whatever. It's more, uh, that's why I call it justification by analogy. You are, you're giving images as an analogy to the first one, similar to the first one, saying, well, the others are labeled like that. And that's why this one is labeled like that. But it's not really an explanation per se. You, uh, I think you also want to make consult offline Hussam and the, and the papers we worked on um, that look at the inaccuracy of of image classifications and ANNs because you did you didn't even show examples of the tough problems that is where multiple things occur in an image and they get misclassified according to looking for only one thing like a picture of a cat and a dog being classified as a picture of a cat because the trained um, a neural network to that point with its training examples never was uh, exposed to dogs, just cats. Yes, I understand that in multi-label uh, setting. Uh, sorry, sorry. Is. Exactly, this is the uh, same question I just typed in the chat box. I also had this uh, question that you have single uh, class problems and that to very focus, but how this works in complex situations? where you have multi-class, multi-object problems and so on. Yes, yes, sure. I, I see, but uh, I think it is going to be our next steps, but I think this already took me, I don't know, five months to solve the computation issues and reach that level of analogy. But uh, the, the results that I just show you, as I, I just showed you, people already uh, call these models black box, you know? It, I, I already opened, some state of the art CNNs for you, but understand that the multi label will be the next step here. One, one uh, sure. just an exp explanation of what you're doing, not the explanation in AI, but explanation of what you're doing. Um, first, there is the, the assumption that the GP is learning at the same time as the CNN. Uh, and if at the end I don't need the CNN anymore, why? Why did I need it in the first place? The GP can do the same thing anyways. What yep. I need to see, what is missing in this explanation of the methodology is how the GP is working in parallel with the CNN to learn at the same time as the CNN so that it actually reaches the same kind of fidelity as the CNN. That is okay. missing. I, I don't get it. I don't know enough uh, GPs so to, to, uh, to understand what you did. But uh, the devil's advocate would say, why do I need the CNN in the first place? I just use GP. Yeah, sure, sure. I think, I think it is completely a very good question. The GP's uh, Gaussian processes, if you, I saw that for instance, people have uh, proposed inference methods for GPs and have run that on CIFAR 10 data set but they cannot reach a very high accuracy by themselves. For instance, the accuracy reaches, I don't know, 80% rather than the 95% that what? I Percent but, what? What's the percentage of reaching percentage? What does that mean? Oh, no, no. My, uh, I mean, uh, the Gaussian processes can reach at most to, I don't know, 80% accuracy when they are trained on CIFAR 10. I mean so, alone when, when they are trained alone, but the point here is that the artificial neural network reaches the state of the art accuracies, as we know, then GP learns from the ANN. That's what is missing. So uh, how do they work in tandem so that the GP can uh, take advantage of the CNN? That is not clear in the presentation. Yeah, I have a supplementary question to that. So sure. when you say that ANN has some X uh, accuracy and Gaussian processes as Y accuracy and X is greater than Y. Then does this analogy still works? And if yes, why? Uh, it might be some different set of uh, learning rules within ANN that uh, are responsible for decision making than in Gaussian processes. So it's just analogy in terms of uh, 
let's say visualization that you have similar set of images and so on. But otherwise, um, theoretically, how it is corresponding to each other, uh, that's that's something missing. Okay, sure. Uh, one point is that uh, the Gaussian process reaches, I don't know, near 80% accuracy if it is left alone. But uh, when, uh, when we kind of, when the analogy happens, the Gaussian process's accuracy reaches, I don't know, to half a percent to ANN. It is very close to ANN because, of course, it can match itself to the ANN. Yeah. I hope, I hope I could. I hope I could make it clear the, that low accuracy is for the case that the GP is left alone with the data set. So, so one of the challenges you create for yourself um, is that much of the world's literature and explanation is decoupled from the accuracy of learning classifiers. They're, they're not, they're, there's no need for them to be totally aligned um, because a good explanation needn't arise from the creation of knowledge, rules, Gaussian distributions, whatever you use. There's no need for it to be as accurate as another complementary machine learning method, whether it's decision trees, random forests, CNNs, whatever it is. Don't lose the essence of why explanations are useful. That seems, seems to me that, that you've substituted the word explanation for what, as Osmar described earlier, is looking for some tightly coupled but different process than a, uh, than a deep neural network and, and showing that if they're deeply coupled, you can explain with your images how one produces the classification the same as the other. That's not explanation. That's, that's mimicking one process with another. How accurate should that be? You only have to read papers by Caroena and Cynthia Rudin, for example, to see that accuracy of the method providing explanation is not the point. It, indeed, some of them can be more accurate than the black boxes. The point is that you get an explanation for someone, like Shaheen has pointed out, um, for someone who can evaluate whether that explanation provides them with increased understanding and trust of the process that's doing the classification. And then remember that classification is, is no rare thing, as we know how to do classification by many methods. It's how those classifications provide support for making decisions, like when you talk about the pathologist looking at, at imaging to, be, to, to determine pathological states and, and attributes. It's the decision making that's important, not the classification per se. And that's where the explanations are vital. So. Be very cautious about what you think an explanation is, because what I've seen today is not to suggest that you shouldn't be doing this and elaborating it. Be cautious of the words you use. And, and all the way back to the beginning, I would take every version of any paper that describes what you said is this transduction and induction stuff, and I would file them carefully away and never read them again. Yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, one point is that, of course, I do not only look at the accuracies, you know, instead, of, you know, besides reaching a similar accuracy, the decisions are the same, are almost the same on the testing set. But uh, I, you know, I, and my second point is that uh, I, I wanted to use this uh, presentation to kind of uh, prevent people from using uh, methods like, I don't know, SHAP and LIME. Because uh, these, these methods kind of bring in additional assumptions. And there are very recent works about uh, how these methods can be fooled. For instance, uh, for perturbation-based methods. I agree, uh, I agree yeah. completely. You don't even have to explain. As uh, uh, in our explainable AI lab, we're mostly abandoning lime and shape a long time ago because the methods we have are already superior. Um, they may not be available on GitHub, but, uh, um, but we're not software developers. We're computer scientists, so I agree. Yeah, sure, thank you very much. And thanks for sending the documents. I'd be happy to receive documents from you and Shoin as well, yeah, because it's your uh, specialty. And, and as well. I mean, uh, the, you should just read some of Hussam's papers. Um, they, they will help give you a perspective on what you use as explanation.
Anyway, thanks for your patience with enduring my um, um, my uh, pointed criticisms. No, no, no problem at all. No. And uh, I wanted to uh, kind of as my takeaways, uh, my first takeaway is that achieving a high case accuracy doesn't mean the solution is good. Yep. Because, uh, because for instance, the, the solution that I showed you for MNIST, it reaches near 100% accuracy, but of course it's not a good way to solve this problem. And uh, my second takeaway was that I think uh, the tool that we have developed, uh, because the tool uh, basically, uh, in the tool uh, you can specify any sub-module of a PyTorch module and all of that stuff happens under the hood. And I personally believe uh, this line of research, of course, it wasn't only us, you know, I read a lot of uh, recent papers. I think this line of research has already unboxed the ANNs, but I'd be happy to listen your your opinions on that as well. I think it was uh, all from my side. I think I, I should leave I should leave it to your questions. The last thing I want you to think about is think about think about this spectrum of relationships between data, between coincidental relationships, correlative relationships for which you can apply and find um, statistical measures that at least confirm strong correlations from weak correlations. And at the other end of the spectrum continuing is causal explanations. And so if you think about what it means to have a causal explanation, this is not a function of the last 10 years of machine learning research. This is about all of science. Science is about formulating hypotheses which give rise to causal explanations. And if you keep that in mind, you'll you'll get a better sense of what you do and where it fits in the big picture of things. Okay, sure, sure. I think, yeah, of course, I think the missing link, or I should say the interesting link is to the causal inference. And yeah, I have, I, I, I am already reading some books from Professor Pearl. I think there are very interesting books yeah, sure, but I understand the causality might be the answer to all of this. Here. Causality has been pursued in science for 300 years at least. Um, so be cautious you don't uh, adopt poor nomenclature of recent papers, which at best are poor scholarship. Um, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Read a little more broadly. Yes, sure. Anyway. Yeah, sure, enough, sure. You're right. Enough crankiness from old Professor Goebel. Oh, no, no. I understand that maybe, I don't know, in last month, because it took me too much. I, I understand that I was too much into Gaussian processes. I understand that this one tool doesn't work. Yeah, completely understand. Well, the reality is no one tool works and that's what you have to sort of uh, grapple with anyway. Thanks everyone thanks for, for your inputs and thanks Amir for presenting today. If we have uh, more questions from the audience, please, please feel free to reach Amir directly. Amir, can you please put your email in the chat box? Sure, so sure. If someone has questions, they can get in touch. Sure, sure. I will just, uh, I just put uh, my email in the chat. Please yeah. feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thanks for your attention again. Thank you everyone for attending to this seminar and thanks Samir for presenting. We will see you next week. Stay safe.